The evidence says that there are fewer female than male entrepreneurs out there. In the US, for example, entrepreneurial activity amongst men is roughly twice the rate of women. In the UK, something like 6% of women are entrepreneurs versus 15% of men. And I'd like just to explore what's going on there. There's obviously lots of factors. Rupa, why don't you give us a sense from your own research and your own intuition? First and foremost, uh, women just don't get funded. So I think the statistics are probably skewed because what we those those numbers that you just shared are probably funded later stage uh, organizations where women don't even get to that next level because they are simply not getting the funding or access to the funding at the same rates as as men do. And some of that is just systemic barriers. Some of it is um, just good old fashioned sexism, Mm -hmm. which we can delve into a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of it is also the uh, lack of it being as socially acceptable for women to fail as it is for mm. men to fail. Olenka, do you want to just give me your us your high level thoughts? On that? We're going to delve into a couple of your specific studies first, but what, yeah. what are the other factors that I'm sure you recognize? The general, at the broader level, I would say they're, they're classified into two separate categories. So the first category is exactly what Rupa mentioned, which is we're always thinking about bias, we're thinking about negative st- stereotypes that mm. in particular prevent VCs, prevent financiers from uh, really interesting women with money, with capital, with other resources that they need in order to succeed. And that, I would think, is the common explanation. Then I would also add that the second category is around the pipeline problems. Mm. And the pipeline might reflect a number of different issues. Mm. So some of them um, are reflecting structural problems. So, Mm. so, So for example, when we think about structural constraints in the workplace. So the Mm. fact that women often are less likely to occupy high level positions. And so because of that, they're also less likely to access resources, to have exposure to opportunities, to have networks that are needed for them to both come up with an idea for a new venture, Mm. but then also mobilize resources to to, to found those ventures. And so so it's not only the evaluations, the bias that Mm. we observe, but also the actual structural problems in the workplace. The way I see it, the fact that we even need to justify with research that it should look more equal is part of the problem itself, right? So I think there is this ingrained bias that just assumes, oh, well, the reason we don't see more women out there in in, as entrepreneurs is because they just don't they don't have it in them. They're they you know, they want comfortable lives. They're not Mm. as risk taking when the reality is it's not just a pipeline problem. It's an echo chamber problem. Mm. I am part of many networks of women founders and I can tell you without a single doubt in my mind that there are dozens, if not thousands of them Mm -hmm. who are underfunded, facing structural barriers, facing social barriers, et cetera, et cetera, that are keeping them from rising to the top. It's not that they don't exist. It's people aren't looking for them. Olenka, I'd like to just dig, dig into a couple of your specific studies. One of your studies called Do Employees Work Less for Female Leaders? What's the answer to that question? The answer is yes. <laughs> and the question is by how much and why it matters. So this is a very interesting study because in general, we tend to think about those pre-entry constraints that women face. So those are the ones that we've just mentioned. So all those structural barriers that prevent women from becoming founders, even if we see women succeeding at founding those ventures, still we observe that they face systematic hurdles when it comes to growth, when it comes to scaling, when it comes to attracting people and motivating their employees, we then uh, ask this question, well, why? Wh- what's going on? Mm-hmm. Um, what's happening when women try to uh, deploy the workforce, when they try to actually get labor on which startups inherently and Indeed. deeply depend? Um, so, so our intuition was that, well, perhaps it's just much harder to get this extra discretionary effort um, that is just so needed for new mm-hmm. ventures. We conduct a bunch of experiments as the first step where we randomly assign people, assign workers to um, startups with founders of different genders. So mm. people were working wow. either for a founder who was a male or a female, and then everything else was was the same. What was interesting is that we asked them to provide a discretionary effort. So overtime work that was not paid, we asked them how willing they would be to do that. And so the findings were striking. So it turns out that when it comes to labor supply, just pure labor supply, 
employees were much less likely to provide that labor to women than to men. And in general, it means that workers worked on average 1.4 hours less a month for women than for men. And that's huge. That's That's actually huge huge if you're a founder, because if you are a female founder, then you have to pay much more to get the same labor Mm -hmm. as compared to to being a male founder. Uh, And were the workers, shall we say, aware that they were even doing this? So probably it was an implicit bias. Yes, although we did ask follow-up questions around um, how did you feel about the task? How did you feel about providing discretionary extra effort? And so what we found was that um, employees were more likely to report that it was unfair to ask for more labor, the labor was more difficult when the founder was was a woman. Let's just talk about the other study, which is called the Motherhood Mm -hmm. Wage Penalty. In general, we tend to think that women pursue entrepreneurship to resolve uh, work-life conflict. So, mm-hmm. so the idea is that because women face disproportionate family demands, they have to um, look for solutions that allow them for greater flexibility. And so past studies show that uh, women often would treat entrepreneurship as the so-called plan B, mm. which means that they would go to self-employment, to stay at home, to have sort of those home-based operations. The question in this study was, well, uh, what about career motivations? Mm. Do women also found new ventures to advance their careers? And so the big finding was that women who become mothers in paid employment are more likely to face uh, significant earning penalties. And this is because usually employers would infer that women with children are not as committed, they're they're just not as reliable. And so therefore, uh, we know there's significant discrimination for women who become mothers in the context of paid employment. Now, what we observed in this study, and and this was based on uh, the entire Swedish population, just to be clear. So we looked at every single person in Sweden, we compared mothers to non-mothers for the same task in the same organization. And then we looked at what happens when a woman becomes a mother. And so what we found was that women who become mothers face significant wage penalties, but then in addition, following that event, they they become they, they're much more likely to found a new venture. And mm. these ventures mm. are incorporated. They're the ones that actually are very highly performing mm. and they allow women to escape that escape that wage penalty that Got they it. face in wage work. Fascinating. There is some additional research um, in America around this idea of the glass cliff, mm-hmm. that when women do le- reach leadership positions, finally break through the, yeah. the, you know, what we used to call the glass ceiling. It's the same exact thing. Employees, uh, senior leaders, which are, again, very often men, uh, will pull back, will work less, less hard, will mm-hmm. sometimes actively try to sabotage. So you have these subtle things happening. And, and again, the research uh, bears this out. But you also have these very o- obvious overt things happening where it's challenging vocally female leaders in you know sort of town hall settings or uh questioning their credibility there's some uh there's a brilliant book coming out about this called the glass cliff Mm -hmm. in which they cite um in one of many instances for example where uh a leader was giving a a woman leader was giving a town hall address to in the financial services industry and one of men in the audience shouted out (laughs) while she was delivering this keynote um, I don't understand what you're saying. Are you high? And and it's not. And so it's overt things like that. And then going back to when women uh, become pregnant, there's great work being done by an organization here called Pregnant Then Screwed mm-hmm. that looks at uh, pregnancy discrimination, and it is shocking to hear the number of women who are overtly told by their employers to get an abortion, Mm -hmm. to fix the problem somehow, because you're not promotable otherwise. So let's not be, you know, sort of sugarcoating this. The reality is often far darker than many people can admit. And then there are NDAs and there's all this sort of Mm -hmm. suppression. And so people can't sort of come out overtly and and sort of talk about their experiences. And and it creates a a, a, a sort of a hostile environment. that why for many people, many women, why wouldn't you just choose to opt out instead of facing that? Uh, for those based in the UK, you might be aware of the Rose Review. This was Alison Rose, former chief exec of NatWest Bank. Uh, that review estimated that if women were entrepreneurs at the same rate of men, you would unlock £250 billion pounds worth of value. One of the things that they talk about is the investing in women code. Mm. Now, can one of you 
Talk a little bit about what that is. I don't know, perhaps you don't know the detail yeah, of it. It's basically um, organizations agree to uh, provide um, financial uh, access and um, additional either sort of educational or mentoring support, almost like a mini accelerator. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's pulling it together for the specific outcome of creating and, and generating a, a larger pipeline of, of female founded businesses. They get corporations, I believe 134 have signed up for mm-hmm. this to sign up to, to, to do the following, to do Correct. the stuff that you talked about. And they about. have to, you know, go through effectively a checklist of things that they will commit right. to. Um, it is too early because, mm-hmm. you know, it's two, three years. Um, and the reality is also com- companies and organizations can commit to something, but right. until the right. money actually changes hands, until right. the resources are actually being deployed, it's right. hard to know how much of that is just really good PR and how much is actually having an impact. Indeed. I, I don't doubt for a second that this is a, a good initiative, um, but let's talk more broadly. What are some of the other opportunities we've got for <clears> unblocking <throat> and challenging some of these these structural barriers? So I tend to think about policy as a big hammer we have in our mm. hands. So mm. so the moment we create policies that reduce the administrative barriers, the time needed to found a new venture, mm. that that's what really makes a huge mm. difference for mm. women. And so we found that in Portugal in particular, when the administrative barriers were mm. reduced, the rate of female founders right? just skyrocketed. So obviously mm. reduce barriers for all, but you're saying it particularly helps it women. Part- particular disproportionately helps women and it's not just about financing that's that's the important point to make because mm. women need time they, they're time constrained mm. and so anything we can do at the level of mm. let's reduce the time it takes that's that's really going to make a difference for mm. women Rupal, other thoughts in terms of things we can do to definitely help? so uh there are two things one is uh closing what i often refer to as the visibility gap because mm. i think if you ask anybody Anyone on the street, name an entrepreneur, name a founder, name a leader, name a, uh, a scientist, an inventor, an artist. Inevitably, the person that are going to conjure up is going to be more often than not a, a, an image of a white male. Mm. And that's not because women and non-white people don't exist in these fields and don't excel in these fields. It's just we don't hear their stories. We don't mm. celebrate their stories. Mm. We don't normalize their stories in the same way that we do, for example, uh, the stories of you know, the end, endless parade of white men that we're, we're often celebrating. Give us three or four yeah. so, examples of successful female entrepreneurs. Uh, Whitney Wolf Hurd, who started Bumble and is, is a unicorn business itself, she co-founded, I think it was Tinder, mm. um, and then had to exit because of that toxic situation. Uh, there is Michelle Monet here in the mm. UK. There's Sarah Blakely in the US, who recently uh, had held it privately and then was recently uh, partly acquired by Blackstone. So the success stories are there. But for whatever reason, even though women can make up 51 percent of the population our stories are often considered niche and are niched in sort of the women's sections of of magazines or the women's conferences or women's entrepreneurship we are doing amazing things people just need to talk about it look for it and celebrate those stories in the same way that they do when when men Hmm. are doing it no one has ever said oh well you know white men have been behind world wars one and two and and economic crashes and booms and bust cycles and and the failures of banks and the failures of this oh we should never let white men lead again right it's laughable it's stupid Mm. to say it right but somehow when women take those same positions or a person of color takes up a leadership position it is somehow their failure is somehow attached to their gender to their their difference olenka what are your thoughts on on particularly finding good role models do you have any examples of famous female entrepreneurs you want to share with us or perhaps how you teach the topic um, to your students just to try to you know, get over some of these challenges? There's research that shows that uh, parents have enormous influence on whether uh, women, men tend to mm. transition mm. to entrepreneurship, whether they become inventors later in their life. And so what we know is that, in fact, women who grow up in families where parents are entrepreneurs or inventors are significantly less mm. likely to become um entrepreneurs or inventors relative to their male siblings. And so it turns out that the reason for it is that parents anticipate that if a woman, if a girl becomes a founder, she becomes an inventor, Mm -hmm. she's going to have much lower returns to it. And so they anticipate those difficulties already. And I think this is where all those barriers that we talked about at the beginning, this is where they they already become created right at the get go. What can male allies do to support this this set of challenges and opportunities that we're we're discussing there, uh, that would be one. And then 
Secondly, I noticed that International Women's Day this year, the theme is inspiring inclusion. Do either of you have a kind of a, a thought on either of those two slightly different points? Invest in women. I, it is that simple. I think, you know, so there, yes, there are many other barriers, uh, but if we genuinely want to change the statistics from 2% of VC funding going to women-led uh, organization companies to something a little bit more rational. Mm -hmm. uh, I think just as an investment thesis, the fact that only 2% goes yeah. to women-led business is, is, is sort of, is just not, it doesn't make sense to me. So I think just invest in women, put your money where your mouth is. And similarly with things like International Women's Day, organizations need to actually put their money where their mouth is. So do you pay your women equally if you are celebrating International Women's Day? Are you paying, you know, for the events that you are doing to celebrate International Women's Day? Do you offer uh, additional support for to enable to you, the women in your organization to stay in your organization, whether they choose to become parents or not? Put your money where your mouth is. And not only invest in women, but also hire women if you are a founder, because mm -hmm. uh, most startups are male founded. And so we know that um, people are much more likely to become founders when they work for a startup because this is where they learn. And so there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Women don't tend to work in startups, and so therefore they're not likely to become founders. So if you are a male founder, then make sure that you hire women so that they can learn, they can acquire all those skills and they can become founders themselves. I think it's not just about, oh, it's a charitable and a philosophical thing to do. Mm -hmm. It makes good common sense business practice to have exactly. your different views represented. Perfect. We will finish there on that very uplifting and practical note. Thank you, Rupal and Olenka, Thank for you. joining us today and sharing your experience and insights.